So today I'm going to talk to you about our work. So we we use um, root hairs. This is my object of study, so I become so obsessed with that that I tend to be like that. <laughs> these are the human hairs and these are the root hairs. And of course, I tend to see uh, roots uh, structures all over the world and all over the in, in every picture I look at that. So you can see my contact information here. So I'm very active also in social uh, networks. So if you want to contact me, I'm very happy to, to discuss about science. And these are my, uh, my affiliation. So why I study root hairs? Because for me, this is a very nice system where these, uh, these single cells, these uh, single plant cells, are able to integrate uh, different kind of signals. You have a nutrient signal coming from the soil. Also, there is a very well-known genetic program that is controlled by several transcription factors. There is also an epigenetic program. For example, we identify one low-known code in RNA called Apollo. And also, these uh, plant cells also integrate endogenous signal like hormones, for example, oxygen and ethylene. On top of that, root hairs are very interesting because they are able to trigger soil formation. Because, as you know, roots are able to secrete substance to the soil. And for example, if you have plants with very uh, long root hair and a lot of root hairs, you will see a lot of soil formation close to the root. But those, for example, a plant or Arabidopsis plant that do not form root hair, there is much less soil formation. On top of that, as I say, hormones are very important. For example, oxygen and ACC, ethylene precursor, are very important to trigger root hair growth. But for example, ABA repress root hair growth. So these cells are very sensitive to root hair growth. So if you if you look at these uh, sorry, at these videos, you can get an idea of the this amazing system to study cell elongation process. So these are roots that are uh, growing into the soil, and what I get fascinated about the root hair is because they are really sensors of the status of the water, as well as nutrients, as well as microorganisms in the soil. So in my lab, we are studying different levels uh, or aspect of the signaling from the cell surface of the root hairs, translational and post-translational processes, transcriptional programs, as well as intracellular calcium signaling. On top of that, in my lab, we are trying to understand several uh, input, environmental inputs and endogenous input like hormones, Nutrient, we are focused on phosphate and nitrate mostly. And also today I'm going to talk about low temperature, but also we are starting to work on high temperature as well as salinity. And as you know, in the field, plant faces several stresses at the same time. So we are trying to combine some of these environmental stress uh, at the same time and trying to understand if the signaling pathways are the same or are different. Okay. So a few years ago, we started to study auxin. So we found that auxin is able to release some specific ARF on root hair cells, ARF 5, 7, and 19. And these ARF were binding to the promoter of a specific transcription factor, specifically RSL4 and possibly RSL2. And more importantly, this transcription factor, RSL4 and 2, we're controlling two group of enzymes that were very important for the rosomeostasis. They are BOH or not BH oxidases, as well as peroxidases. So this was the kind of the first study that we, we were able to link an, a hormone with transcription factor with the rosomeostasis. So I became interested to understand more of this signaling pathway, but introducing some uh, stresses. On top of that, we know that the root is able to sense nutritional status of the soil in the root tip. And this is because uh, most of the oxygen biosynthesis happens here in the root tip. And when you have a maximum of oxygen here, then you have transport 
into the epidermis mostly and then the amount of oxygen will define how much the root hair will elongate so you have the perception of the nutrients here nitrate and phosphate but the uptake of the nutrient it happened mostly at the root hair level so you have more like a local sensing here then you have a transport and then you have here uh, an uptake so you can see that the process of sensing and uptake is not exactly the same at the molecular level we understand quite well how nitrate and phosphate are sensed and how this trigger the root hair specific genes transcription or expression but in the few years ago we started to look at what happened with the low temperature which is the relation between the nutrients and the low temperature effect and this is what i'm going to talk today so the first result that was kind of surprising for us was that when we put the root growing at 10 degrees instead of 22 that is the room temperature the normal temperature we can see a massive growth of these cells although the root stopped growing the root hair grows to false and this was completely unexpected and i asked, i remember i asked my student no please repeat the result because it's impossible and of course this was very reproducible of course if you lower the temperature from 10 to 2 degrees or 0 degrees of course you don't have this process so when i saw this result i said okay here there are something very new and interesting because it was not reported before okay so we did more more careful experiment and we we start growing the root for five days at 22 and then one day at 10 degrees two days and three days and you can see that after three days we can see this response why three days because we know that we need to develop a new root under 10 degrees to see this effect so those root here that grow at 22 they will not resume the growth and start growing again usually when root here grows and it stops they do not grow again they stop there okay so this is why we need three days to see this this clear phenotype but then we test different temperature because white tempers 10 degrees so you can see here that they are a, an upregulation of root hair length very clearly but if i lower the temperature to four to six degrees it's clear that the the there is a repression again so there are something special about this temperature 10 very moderate or mild low temperature that is important for root hair okay so before in the lab we also uh, uh, identified together with uh, Dick Ariel and Martin Crespi France one long coding RNA that was very important for root hair growth at low temperature we found that 10 degrees upregulate this Apollo this low no coding RNA and interestingly we found one of the first interaction between a low no coding RNA and transcription factor and this control this the expression of R86 and RSL4 that they are the two master regulators of the transcriptional program at the root hair level and the other thing that was Keiko Sugimoto in Japan that found another very interesting finding that RSL4 the master regulator is controlled negatively controlled by CTL1. So when there is a lot of nutrient in the media, the root hair do not grow. And how this is controlled? Because CTL1 repress RSL4. So as you can see, there is a very fine tuning uh, mechanism to control these master regulators. So another experiment we did, very simple experiment, is to increase the amount of MS. So if we increase the amount of nutrient in the media, you can see that this uh, low temperature effect disappeared. So this was an indication that the low temperature effect of root hair growth was not directly the temperature, was something that the temperature does to the media, this is what we believe. And also when we increase the agar strength, that we reduce the mobility of the nutrients in the media, we can suppress completely this uh, upregulation of the growth of 10 degrees. Then we did another very simple experiment. We used agarose 
And when you have agarose, you don't have any trace of any nutrient, neither phosphate, neither nitrate. And when we use agarose, we can suppress completely the effect of the temperature. And on top of that, we did the experiment under dark, because we know that light can modify some of the root developmental process. So we, we did the same experiment using the root system, we can also see the same, that under agarose, that there is no nutrients, there is a completely suppression of the root hair growth. So this indicates that the low temperature is affecting in some way the mobility and accessibility of the specific nutrient in the media that trigger this uh, very strong uh, root hair growth response. And the other very simple experiment we did is the same with the temperature, 10 degrees here, but we are increase the amount of nitrate. So when we increase the amount of nitrate, you can see that this upregulation of growth also disappear. And this was the first indication that maybe nitrate is one of the nutritional signal that is being affected by the temperature. And in agreement with that, when we measure the gradient, the, the diffusion of nitrate under the temperature in an agar plate, if you put the agar plate at 10 degrees, the diffusion is much lower than at 22. So we measure the amount of nitrate here. So here we have a, a known concentration of nitrate, and then we measure at different distance. So we found that 10 degrees is much lower the amount of nitrate that arrived to the 0.3. So this is telling you, is telling us that the nitrate is being affected, the diffusion of nitrate is being affected. And on top of that, and this also was very surprising, is that this process of root hair growth of 10 degrees is well concerned with some crops. For example, in Brachypodium, if we put 10 degrees, you can see longer root hairs. Also, it's true for rice and for wheat. And this, we are very happy with the result because we can now be sure that when we are studying Arabidops, this is also relevant for agronomically important crops, okay? So today I'm going to tell you two small stories about this low temperature effect on good hair and how we approach them in two completely different ways. One is to use an Ashiwas approach, it's completely unbiased approach using a natal, natural variation. And the second approach is more targeted and is related to the plant cell surface signaling. What happened in the surface of the root hair? And what happened with the perception of the temperature and the nutrients? So I will start with the first part, with the shiwas. So we took uh, accessions and ecotype for um, all over the world. We measure root hair length. Here you can see at 22 degrees. And here you can see at 10 degrees. Usually, uh, uh, those accessions that grow more at 22 grow more at 10 degrees and there is a very nice correlation between them but it's clear that the, the low temperature effect is, um, is massive because you can see uh, two, uh, uh, up to two or three fold increase in cell elongation okay? so when we interrogate the shiwas and see which are the the SNPs, or which are the changes in this genome that could explain this variability in the ecotypes. And we found one region here that was a nice association between the phenotype and the genotype. And um, we found that one peroxidase was encoded here. And we have several uh, SNP uh, with very strong uh, statistical significance. And on top of that, this peroxidase 62 was highly upregulated at 10 degrees. So it seems that some changes in peroxidase 62 is giving some accession the possibility to grow more and some accessions to grow less. On top of that, we explore another RNA seq data available at, at 10 degrees specifically. And we found that on top of the peroxidase 62, that is in the root hair, uh, expression in the root hair, expressed in the root hair, we have a, a peroxidase 69, that is also highly expressed in root hairs. 
they are other peroxidases that are also regulated at low temperature, but these are expressed in endodermis and vascular tissue, and we are not interested in that. So this is just a cellular map of expression. So taking it, uh, this into account, we also uh, use a um, pharmacological approach. We use sham, that is an inhibitor of the peroxidase activity. So when we apply sham, we can see that this is a regulation by the low temperature. When we apply sham, there is no regulation at all of the growth. So this is telling us that the peroxidase activity is required for this low temperature response. And also the peroxidase activity here is lower when we apply sham. The amount of sham we apply is very low because we want to affect only the root hair growth, but not the root growth. And this is why the activity is still present in the whole root. So we isolate mutant as we usually do. We isolate two TDNA mutant for peroxidase 62 and two TNA mutants for peroxidase 69. Most of them were nulls, no expression, and uh, 62-2 has a little bit of expression. When we look at the phenotype, I, I don't know if you are aware, but there are 69 or 72 apoplastic peroxidase encoded in Arabidopsis genome. So there are a lot of redundancy. So as expected, the single mutant didn't have any phenotype. But only the double mutant, peroxidase 6269, we are lucky enough to see that is not able to grow as the wild type at 10 degrees. On top of that, we want to check that these two peroxidases are being expressed in root hair cells. So we did a transcriptional reporter for peroxidase 62 and 69 with GSP. And we can see that there are nicely expressed in root hairs, and also they are upregulated by low temperature, okay? And then we took the other approach. We overexpressed some of them. So we expressed uh, peroxidase 62. We have two lines here, and only one line for 69. And this result was kind of surprising because for 62, we can see an enhancement of growth at both temperatures. But for 69, we didn't see any change. So this is telling us that probably 62 and 69 are not doing exactly the same job. But still, we don't understand which are the difference between them because you need to knock out both to have a, a, a root hair growth phenotype. And the, the overexpression was high in both cases because the line were overexpressing quite a lot of the, of the transcript in both cases. But then we, we ask, okay, we can have more global view of what is going on here. So this is 22 and, 20 and 10 in the wild type and the double mutant at 22 and 10. And you can see that there are six clusters here from one to six, where there is a huge upregulation of a group of genes that is misregulated in the double mutant. When we look at the GO component, most of them were related to cell wall. And when we look at the genes that are upregulated here in the wild type, but not in the double mutant, we have a lot of peroxidases. But also we have a group of uh, proteins that's called extensins. I will explain a little bit why we think that extensins are relevant to, to this process. Extensins are uh, very repetitive proteins that they are look like the collagen. So they are very modular proteins. And the important thing, they have these tyrosines here. And these tyrosines here are very important because the peroxidases are able to cross-link them and allow them to form an extensive network on the cell wall. And these are all the papers we have described because we describe all the enzymes that make a functional extensin. So the hydroxylases and also the glycosyl transferase that add the sugars on, it, on them. And also lately we identify one uh, protease that is important to control this extensive network quality control, let's say, or, or proteolysis. And why this is important? Because extensins 
control the elongation of the root hair as well. So we believe that this is a connection between peroxidases and the cell wall. And this, for some reason, we uncover these two peroxidases that are important for nutrient mobility and triggered by the moderate low temperature. So well, to, in order to, to prove that, we use um, a reporter for the extensin that it has a fluorescent protein here and a control that is only the fluorescent protein. And then we did plasmolysis in order to quantify how much of the extensin is located on the cell wall here. And you can see that at 10 degrees there are a lot of extensin, much more than that 22. But when we add, a, sorry, uh, 22 here, and this is just the control. When we add sham, we suppress this uh, insolubilization of the extensin mediated by peroxidase. And this is what we are quantifying here. So there was a link trying to link um, why these peroxidases are important for to have a global low temperature and we believe it's because they control extensing insolubilization and this is our current model of this first part of the work and also we have some data I don't have the time to, to show you but we have a data that shows that the RSL4 and R86 are transcription factors that control also the expression of these of these peroxidases Okay. And these were some of the, of the conclusion of the first part, that the low temperature, um, a strong root hair growth response involves these two peroxidases, and we believe that this is through the extensive insolubilization in the, in the cell wall. And then uh, we know that RSL4 is controlling this expression of these uh, enzymes that regulate uh, cell wall structuration. So now I will switch to the second part of the talk, talking about plant cell surface signaling. And you know that when we talk about signaling pathways, you can have two situations. One is a, an autocrine system, where you have the receptor here and the ligand in the same cell type. And you have an autocrine signaling here that they form a positive a feedback loop. Or you can have one cell that secretes the ligand and another cell that has a receptor. And this, for example, is true for, for pollen tubes. But in the case of root hair, we have this uh, autocrine signaling system. So far, we know. So uh, we, together with other group, we have identified two receptors that are very important. One is called Erulus and one is Feronia. These two receptors are highly expressed in, in root hair cells and uh, they are important for triggering or controlling the cell elongation process. On top of that, so this is how feronia is being expressed in root hair when you tag with GFP. And you can see that when the root hair starts to polarize, you can have a maximum of expression and then you have the receptor all over the cell surface. And this is the ligand, it's called Ralph or rapid alkalinization factor one, that is one of the most well studied. And you can see that those local have the same uh, pattern that feronia, which makes sense because it's the ligand of the receptor. So before we study, so this is feronia here in the cell surface, we study that half one is able to bind to the extracellular domain of feronia, that is called malectin domain. So one is bind to the malectin domain, it will activate feronia, and importantly, feronia will be able to phosphorylate this uh, translation factor that is called F4E. And F4E is very important because it will be one of the modulators of the rapid translation process of very specific mRNAs, including RSL4 that I mentioned before. And this process is very important because good hair needs to take decision in time, in, in terms of minutes or seconds. So it, it cannot rely on the transcription, the transcriptional program. The transcription will come later on, but the, the protein um, translation has to be very fast because the, the root hair is 
will be sensing the conditions in the media and it will decide if it's going to grow or not. And for that, it relies on protein translation. And this process has to be very fast. And this is why I think this kind of um, signaling is, is key for these uh, fast growing cells. Okay? So we started studying this process in low temperature. So we have the mutant for Feronia, and you can see there is no response at all. Feronia 4 is a completely knockout. And Feronia 5 here has only the extracellular domain, but it doesn't have the kinase domain here. And you can see also it's not able to respond to low temperature. But the rulus, that is the cousin of Feronia, is, is very close, uh, is able to respond almost like wild type. It's telling us that it's a, this process is being regulated by Feronia, but not by Irulus. And this is nice because it seems that it's something specific. It's not that both receptors are doing the same. On top of that, we measure the amount of Feronia in the cell surface. And at 10 degrees, we have much higher signal. So there is more of the receptor being active on the on the plasma membrane as well as in the rest of the of the root. And on top of that, when we measure the amount of feronia phosphorylated, when we apply the low temperature effect, here uh, at the three days treatment, we can see that all feronia is being activated. And this is very important because downstream feronia, we know that this will trigger a massive recruit hair growth. So it makes sense that it's, it's active. Okay? And you know that uh, in this uh, fast growing cells, energy is, is very important. And we know that TOR is one of the universal eukaryotic sensors. So we start asking that maybe Feronia and TOR are related. So in plant, we have only one TOR1 complex that is composed by TOR, the kinase, Raptor, and LST8. And this form TOR-C1 complex. In plant, we don't have TOR2 complex that is present in another uh, eukaryotic system. Okay? But the important thing that TOR and this complex is a sensor of, for example, oxygen, light and sugars as well as nutrient amino acid and hormones and how uh, control this signal because downstream upregulate the translation of specific proteins okay so you have tor raptor that is phosphorylate and then one very common downstream component is sa kinase and this rib ribosomal protein RPS6 uh, phosphorylate. So, with this in mind, we test if TOR is also involved in this process. So, we have an RNAi line because you know that the mutant of TOR, the knockout, is lethal. So, it's not possible to knock out TOR completely. So, we silence TOR in a specific stage, and we can see that the root here is not able to respond to the low temperature. And also when we use ACD, that is a, um, a biochemical inhibitor of TOR activity, it also represses this, this root hair mediated uh, low temperature growth. So in some way, this, this phenotype that it was very strong for the TOR was very similar to Feronia. So we asked, maybe they are both connected. So what we did based first is to take all the complex component of the TOR1 complex, LST8, for example, and Raptor1b, and there is no low temperature response. And when we overexpress TOR, we can have a very enhanced growth of the root hair. When we knock out uh, the ribosomal protein here, that is also downstream of TOR signaling pathway, also no low temperature response. And when we overexpress SSIK, that is the kinase that is downstream TOR, we have an upregulation of, of growth. So this is telling us that TOR1 is, is regulating also the root hair growth at, at low temperature. 
But which is the connection between feronia in the surface and tor that is in the cytoplasm? And the connection is a physical connection. It seems that tor is able to interact with the kinase domain of feronia. In some way, feronia kinase is able to recruit the tor or the tor complex, we don't know, and uh, activate tor. And this is it was shown by several methods. I don't want to go into detail. You can go to this paper. And what we did is to measure the amount of interaction between feronia and tor at 22 and at 10 degrees. And more importantly, at three days of low temperature, you can see that there is an enhancement of the amount of feronia that is being pulled down with tor. So this is telling us that that the low temperature is enhancing the interaction between the, these two. And this is something really new even for the animal field, because having a polar tor a close to the plasma membrane, as far as I know, nobody else has shown that before. We show it specifically by immunolabeling, by using an antibody, and we can see that tor is being polar in root hair as expected. And when we have feronia mutated that cannot recruit tor, you can see there is no polarization of tor protein. It makes sense with the, with the previous result. And then also we found that the tor phosphorylation is dependent on feronia because when we mutate feronia, there is much le uh, less amount of tor being phosphorylated. And in consequence, at 10 degrees, also we have much higher S6K kinase being phosphorylated by TOR, as expected. And when we mutate feronia, feronia 4, this phosphorylation disappears. Or, for example, this is a feronia with a kinase dead. So this is a kinase that is not functional. You can see that almost there is no no match for phosphorylation, specifically at 10 degrees. So, as I showed you before, low temperature is linked in some way with nitrates uh, by this result. So we wonder if NRT 1.1, that is a, the transporter and also is a receptor of the nitrate, is called transceptor, so when we have the two mutants for NRT1 that is not functional, it's not there, it's, it's a knockout, or you have a mutation here that uh, is a fofomimic that changes the, uh, the affinity of this uh, transceptor of the nitrate, the root hair is completely blind to the temperature. So it doesn't matter if the temperature is 22 or 10 degrees, it gives you the same, the same phenotype. So this is telling us that this uh, nitrate transceptor is also involved in this in this signaling pathway. Okay. So with that we have this this model for this second part. We have feronia here. Now we are studying which are the peptides, the ligands that activate this pathway at low temperature. We have three RALF identified. I cannot say where, uh, which one. Sorry. Um, so we have the RAL that activates feronia here. So this activation of feronia is triggered by low temperature, but we think that it's related at least with nitrate. We are now uh, doing an experiment to see phosphate also involved in this low temperature response. And once feronia is activated, it's been it's able to recruit TOR, to phosphorylate TOR, and to activate the TOR pathway to trigger root hair growth. Also, I didn't show you the result, but we know that ROP2 is also involved in this response. So we have kind of two different pathways. We have ROP2 that also depends on feronia, and ROP2 is also a, mod is a regulator of ROP, of TOR, sorry. So ROP2 is also able to activate TOR. So we have at, at least two different pathways that at the end give you an active TOR complex that will trigger this kinase and then root hair growth here. 
So these are some of the conclusions of this second part of the of the talk. That Tor inhibition uh, remind us that is similar to Feronia and both control root hair growth, especially at low temperature. We know that Feronia is able to activate Tor and downstream Tor, and mutant and overexpress all of the Tor1 complex has an alter root hair growth phenotype. And now we are trying to, you know, to go deeper into this question, which are the nutritional signals that activate Feronia and Tor1. We know that nitrate is one of the nutritional signals that might activate Feronia and Tor, but probably is not the only one. Um, and we know that NRT1 is involved in this, in this process. So the question is, NRT1 is how NRT1 is linked to Feronia. So we, know, we don't know if Feronia is able to phosphorylate directly NRT1 to activate or there is a, another kinase involved on this process. And this is a, a comment we wrote in Trends in Plant Science related to this finding that was very surprising for us, that usually in all eukaryotic system, including plants, TOR complex is inactivated, is activated by amino acid, glucose, or nutrients, by in a high energy environment, high energy, high nutrient environment. What we found for root hair is the opposite. We found that TOR is being activated, activated when there is low nutrient, low temperature or low nitrate. And this activate TOR and this activate root hair growth. So there are something different in how this system is being set up in root hair in comparison with the rest of the plant or the rest of the eukaryotic system where you need energy nutrients to activate TOR. So we are trying to figure out which is the difference here, why, why TOR is behaving in the opposite way. But I found it very, very interesting, very fascinating, I think. And, uh, you know, everything I have shown you here is on agar plates. So now the lab is trying to move into rhizobots, rhizotrons, and we're trying to validate all this result but using real soil. And you can see here that we can track very nicely root hairs on the rhizoboxes. So hopefully we will have a soon new results to validate the agar, the agar media and try to move into more real situations. And the other thing, very short, I would, I would like to tell you at the end of this talk is that you know, I'm part of this Millennium Nucleus for the Development of Super Adaptable Plants. This is uh, located in Chile. And here what we are trying to do is to take all the knowledge we have in Arabidopsis and try to see if we can apply that into uh, more uh, real plant, more agronomically relevant plant. For example, we are working on Microtom and also we are working together with companies that are interested in this development. So far we have a Microtom that has modified roots and it looks like they have uh, produced a bigger fruit and more fruit. So we are in, I think, in a good track to try to apply all the root biology knowledge into a more uh, apply uh, uh, products. And the other thing I want to tell you is about that I, I care about science, but also I care about art. So uh, we try to link um, both aspect of life, reaching a route between art and science. So we did this, this um, uh, demonstration in a museum, it was very nice when we did this uh, 3D root with all the this all this color here and nutrients or bacteria or different things that we stick into the roots and we have uh, children coming from school so we talk about this about the root about the, the what happened in the soil and uh, also we're trying to motivate the scientific uh, knowledge at early ages. 
So with that, also we have uh, done a couple of covers in journals, also related to roots and root hairs as well. And this is my lab, so I, I would like to thank both labs because without them I, I cannot do anything. So this is my lab in Argentina, so thank you. And also my lab in Chile uh, with the people involved. So here you have my contact information. I'm very active on Twitter as well. These are some of my collaborators all over the world. So thanks to all of them because this is a teamwork. It's impossible to do good science alone. And thank you for your attention. I would like to thank all the grant agency and especially Zihed that have helped me a few years ago when I didn't have money at all to work. So it was very important for me to get this grant at that time. And, and I'm open to, to question and, and thanks for coming to the seminar. I'm very happy to, to be here.